to start our last topic of study, which is refraction. Okay, um, and I want to start with an example that you might think has nothing to do with refraction. And that is the beach. If this is the beach, and this is the ocean, and you are lifeguarding, this is you. And there's a person over here, and they are drowning. How would you get to them as quickly as possible? Dive towards them. Straight down. So, so you know the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So it makes sense that you would do this. Except what? The current water. Forget about current. Let's pretend it's a lake. Wait. It's harder to go faster in water. Yeah, you're generally slower in the water than you are running. Right? You generally run faster than you swim. So maybe this is not the best option. Yes? Well, it would be better to go all the way to, like, directly in front of them first. Directly over so and then down? So you think you should go, like, here? Yeah. Okay. And then a straight line. Because like then it minimizes the distance to the water. Okay, but it also makes it a lot longer total distance. It does. It does. Wow, like this one, I'm running. If you curve, okay, that's a good good point. It turns out that the fastest way for you to get from you to the person is somewhere between the shortest distance and like the shortest distance spent in the place where you're slower. It's somewhere here. Where it's not like straight down to the person and it's not a straight line, but it's some combination of those things. Okay. Um, and that is, notice the word refraction is also bent in a similar way. Refraction of things and refraction of light is kind of the same idea. So if, the, in this video what they do is they have a car and they roll it down a ramp. Okay, and as it's rolling down the ramp it rolls over different materials where the car goes different speeds and it shows you what happens. So, straight line, right? And then replace it with carpet. Watch it. So it's going in one direction, and then it changes direction. Okay, so this is something that you might not have seen before, but particles will also refract or change direction. And the reason is that light and particles both choose to take the path of least time, as we call it, or the most efficient path. Um, and it has to do with this concept of different velocities. Um, and so we, you know, when we first started talking about light, we talked about a lot, we sort of drilled into you that C is the speed of light and it's this constant, and it's 3 times 10 to the 8, and the speed of light is a constant, the speed of light is a constant, the speed of light is a constant. But it's not a constant, it's a constant in a vacuum, okay? So it is constant in a vacuum, but just like sound changes its speed depending on what medium it's going through, light also changes its speed depending upon what medium it is. And it never goes faster than 3 times 10 to the 8th, but sometimes it goes slower. So, for example, in air, it's like 2.9999999999 times 10 to the 8th. And in diamond, it's 1.2 times 10 to the 8th. You don't have to write these numbers down, okay? In glass, it's 2 times 10 to the 8th. In water, it's 2.2 .2 times 10 to the 8th. So, depending on the medium, uh, and it's not just density, but it's some of some of it does have to do with density. 
um, depending upon the medium, the speed of light changes and it decreases. Okay, and that is why light bends in the same way that the car changed direction because its speed changed in that medium. Okay, and that's why it was most efficient for you to take a particular path when you were running along the beach and swimming in the water. So the speed of light in a vacuum, 3 times 10 to the 8, is the fastest light can be. And most of the universe is a vacuum. But here on Earth, a lot of times, light goes through other stuff, right? Glass, water, air, sometimes diamonds if you're lucky. And we define how much the speed of light changes in a medium by something called the index of refraction. And we use the variable n for index of refraction, and it's a unitless number. And it's defined by the factor by which light is slowed in a medium. So if n is 2, then it's slowed by a factor of 2. It's cut in half. Okay, if n is 1 and a half, then it's divided by 1 and a half. If n is 3, then it's cut in a third. Okay, so it's the factor by which light is slowed down in a medium. And the equation is, to find the index of refraction, is n is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum, divided by the speed of light in the medium. Okay, so <clears throat> it's the ratio. So if n is 2, then c is twice that speed of light in the medium, or the speed of light in the medium is half the speed of light um, in a vacuum. You'll see this equation in a couple of other formats. So n equals c over v is one of them. You'll see V equals C over N as another one. Like if you want to know how, what is the speed of light in that medium, then if N is 2, I take C and I divide it by 2. If N is 3, I take C and I divide it by 3. If N is 1.5, I take C and I divide it by 1.5. And that tells me how fast light moves through the other medium through which it's going. Okay? Questions so far? Have you guys heard of the term index of refraction before? How about refraction? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So here are just some common indices, that's plural for index of refraction. The, the index of refraction of a vacuum is 1. That means that the speed of light in a vacuum is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum. Right? That makes sense. Air is 1.000293. But for our purposes, when we say air, we mean a vacuum. Okay, the difference between the speed of light in air and the speed of light in a vacuum is so small that it's not gonna, we're not gonna deal with it. Okay, so when you say see air, you can use the index of refraction of one. Water is 1.33. Glass depends on the type. Okay, so it, different types of glass have, are, have different properties. Um, 1.5 is like an average, I guess. It goes like 1.3 to 1.8 or something like that. Diamond is 2.5. <clears throat> That's not all the things that light goes through, right? Light goes through plastic and it goes through um, uh, argon, right? And it goes through other <laughs> gases. But we argon. don't really That's see that that much. Okay. Okay. So, since light changes speed, it has to bend when it changes the medium that it's in. And it bends instantaneously. It doesn't curve. It hits the, the boundary between the two media, and it bends instantly. So, this is like the, when we talk about a, a ray diagram, when we talk about like the anatomy of a ray diagram, this is a refraction ray diagram anatomy beginning. So, this line here, the horizontal line, represents the boundary between two different uh, types of stuff, right? So for example, here's a piece of glass. This line represents this boundary, okay? Air, glass. So it's like this, okay? Um, medium one is the medium through from which the ray is coming from, and medium two is the ray that the, um, sorry, the medium that the ray is going through. and we call the two indices of refraction N1 and N2. So one is where it starts, two is where it goes. Um, and in this case, I just chose simple numbers, N1 equals one and N2 equals two. 
And you don't really need to know that, but I did it because I wanted to be accurate with my angles and stuff like that. Um, and so this, the first thing you will, oh, and then there's a normal line, right? You always draw a normal line. And my incident <coughs> ray hits the boundary. And then it bends. Okay, but when we measure things, when we're doing refraction, we measure the angle theta 1, because we're in medium 1 and we're using n1. Theta 1 is measured with respect to the normal, just like we do in all optics. We measure with respect to the normal. This is theta 1. And then it bends, okay? And it bends in a certain way. And in this case, we say it bent toward the normal, okay? And we can measure that angle with respect to the normal and call it theta 2. When we say toward the normal, we mean with respect to a particular direction. So if this ray were not going to go through a different medium, it would just keep going in a straight line, right? It would go along this straight line. But instead, it's bent in a direction that brings it closer to the normal line. So we call that toward the normal. If it were to bend in a direction that takes it farther away from its original path than the normal line, then we would say it's bending away from the normal. Okay, but in this situation, this ray is bending toward the normal. And an example of that is when light goes from air into glass. And if I use my sweet ray box here, I can show you the path that light takes when it goes from air into glass. So here is my incident rays, and you can see that it bends toward the normal, right? Let's do it with one ray. Maybe that's easier for you to see. You've got a single ray, and it's bending toward the normal. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. I can't really angle it, so you've got to either move or, I don't know. But you can see also some of the light reflects off of the surface of the mirror, or the glass, right? But that's not really the part that we're talking about right now. We're talking about the part that goes through. So it bends toward the normal when it goes in, but you'll also notice that it bends away when it comes out on the other side. Okay, I don't know if you can see on the top, or maybe if I do it this way. You see it goes back to the original direction that it was going. And it's subtle, right? The bending is subtle, but it's definitely there. Okay, so that's refraction. Now, this is a different situation, where now my n1 is 2 and my n2 is 1. This is the part that I was talking about when the light was coming back out of the glass. So you're going from a medium that's like higher density, like glass, into a medium that's lower density, like air. And you do the same thing. You draw your incident ray, you measure your incident angle, but then it bends away from the normal. Okay, so it depends on which medium has a higher index of refraction, which way the light is going to bend. Okay, so it's not always super obvious the direction that light will bend. So, useful skills. This is very important. Now we have medium 2, which is air, and medium 1, which is water, with n equals 1.33. And there's a fish in the water. And you want to spear the fish. Because you are uh, on a deserted island and this is your only way to survive. So you will thank me someday. <laughs> the fish is not giving off its own light, right? In the same way when we drew ray diagrams for mirrors and we had that green arrow, it wasn't giving off its own light. But neither are you, and I can see you, right? The reason I can see you is because light is coming in and reflecting off of you. But it seems like you are the, the source of the light, right? So it's going to seem to your eye like the fish is the source of the light. So we're going to pretend that the, the ray that you see starts at the fish, okay? So we're going to have a ray starting at the fish and hitting this boundary. And because it's going from, notice medium 1 is on the bottom now, it's going from... 1.33 index of refraction to 1 index of refraction, water to air, which way will the ray bend? Away from the normal. 
away from the normal. Yep, so it's going to bend away from the normal. And these angles, they're not extreme, but they're correct. So, unfortunately, it doesn't look as cool. There's your second angle, theta 2. And if you look, your eye, remember, your eye says, oh, yeah, light travels in a straight line. So, your eye thinks that ray came from back there. Okay, and so you see a fish there when really the fish is a little bit lower and closer. Okay, so if you're so trying to spear a fish and you're standing on the shore and you see a fish, where should you aim? A little lower and closer. A little bit closer to you, yeah, and a little bit lower. Okay, and only a little bit. Notice that the, the angle, the, the refraction angle is not extreme, but it's definitely there. Okay, does everyone get the whole ray tracing back thing now? Your eye doesn't know or can't perceive that there's a boundary there. So it says, oh, that ray <coughs> must come from back, straight back from where I see it. Questions so far? Okay. So. What I have here. is a beaker and then another beaker. And when I put the little beaker inside of the big beaker, you say, oh, there's a little beaker inside of the big beaker. So far so good? Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm going to take a commonly used substance, which is vegetable oil. <laughs> and Boring you? No. This is like the best magic trick ever. Watch. So here we go. Where did they go? Oh. I can't see it. You have to be a sorcerer. That's the only way. What? I know. It's gone. No. 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 First person to figure this out. People are so bad. And it had words on the chair. Yeah, you can still see, you, if you look, you can see the, um, the markings on the inside one. They're right here. Okay? So you, it's still there, I promise. I promise it's still there. But you can't see it anymore. Why? Why? Does glass and vegetable oil have the same attraction? Glass and vegetable oil, this kind of glass, Pyrex, and vegetable oil have almost exactly the same index of refraction. So instead of looking like a piece of glass and then some air and then a piece of glass and then some air, it looks like a big piece of glass because they have the same index of refraction. So the reason that you see the one inside of it is because the light is bending and then bending back as it comes out. And so you see that shifting. Okay? Same thing if you, there are some pieces of glass in this box that I'm going to give you. And if you take it and you look at something and you do this with it, you see it move. You see it shift locations. There's a song. Oh, yes. And I what I want you to do is to read the lyrics, listen to the song, really listen. Like, give it all of yourself. And, <laughs> and try to write down the equation that he's singing to you, okay?
proved navigation and measured the earth. He gave us the sign law, that wonderful guide, and he made more precise calculations of pi. Singing in one time made us a one day. Equals and two signs made us up to hip hooray. <laughs> His greatest feat came in 1621, when optics and science was really begun. While flashes of lightning illumined his page, he wrote down Sell's Law, his great gift to the age. So if you wear glasses or like to fry ants, be grateful your lenses were not made by chance. Astronomers hail him with each newfound star. Microscopists toast him from each CZ bar. Singing and one sign theta sub one a a a equals n two sign theta sub two hit hooray. Some credit Harry, and others Descartes. Both studied refraction, and both were real smart. But we prefer Villa, Broad, Van Roy, and Snell. He laid down the law, and he did it darn well. Singing in one sign, theta sub one, a a a equals n two sign, theta sub two, hit hooray. So hopefully you wrote down this. And yeah, one yeah, sign data sub one, hey, 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 yes. equals and two sign data sub two, hip hooray. Nice. Huh? You can think the hey, hey, hey. This song will never go, it's going to stay in your mind for like at least the rest of the day. Probably the rest of your life. Good. So this is Snell's Law. I mean, it, so like I was telling you, basically the thing that you're usually looking for is how does the light bend? That's theta 2. How does it change its direction? But theta 2 is dependent upon theta 1, the angle of incidence, and n1 and n2. Okay, and so the calculation is pretty easy, but don't forget, sometimes you're going to have to solve for an angle. So if I want to solve for theta 2 in this equation, what's the very first thing I need to do? Divide by n2, and then what do I have? Sine of theta 2. So to get theta 2 by itself? Inverse sine. Yeah, inverse sine. Okay, so 